Good morning and welcome to the fall term of Saturday University. Uh, Saturday University is sponsored by the University of Wyoming and the University of Wyoming Foundation and by the Wyoming Humanities Council. And we work very closely with a group of local sponsors, uh, the Teton County Library and its foundation, the National Museum of Wildlife Art, obviously, uh, Central Wyoming College, and uh, this time we'd like to, to thank the uh, Anglers Inn for donating uh, lodging for our visiting uh, speakers today. I'm Paul Flesher, and I'm going to be the MC for today. Uh, at the University of Wyoming, I direct the Religious Studies program, but uh, here I'm devoted to Saturday University and uh, will simply uh, help guide you through the morning's events. I'd like to start uh, by introducing our first speaker today, Dr. Eric Sandine. And to do so, let me set up a little comparison. Uh, I've been at the university for 19 years, and during that entire time, I've been the director of the Religious Studies program, which I think is a long time. Um, but I've always known that Eric has been around longer than I have, and uh, has actually been a director longer than I have. And in fact, when I check the dates, it turns out that this year is Eric's 30th anniversary as director of American Studies. Congratulations, <laughs> Eric. During, during that time, Eric has taken the American Studies program from a nascent entity to a program with a bachelor's degree and an internationally known master's degree. Its emphasis on public programming and public activity has attracted uh, students from all around the world. I've served on a couple of committees with students from the Middle East. Uh, there are people from various parts of Europe and other places as well that come as well as you know, Wyoming students and, and people from the Rocky Mountain region, and uh, it's, it's a real good experience that he has going there. But even as he has grown the American Studies program at UW, Eric has been helping the creation and building of American Studies programs around the world. During a five-year appointment as a Fulbright Senior Academic Specialist, that's a neat little technical term there, he worked with University College Dublin, and the University of Tartu in Estonia. He has also consulted, run workshops with, seminars with other uh, Ac American Studies programs in countries such as uh, Germany. He's worked at uh, universities in Copenhagen and Odense in Denmark, uh, as well as several universities in England such as Durham and Swansea, to say nothing of Luxembourg, Sweden, and then there's the Eastern Bloc countries like Poland and Kazakhstan and Macedonia and the Czech Republic and Lithuania, Belarus, Bulgaria, and even Russia itself. However, Eric is a man of Wyoming and, and Wyoming has always been close to his heart. And so today he's going to speak about Wyoming's Heart Mountain Relocation Center, a living legacy where our American Studies program has had an uh, important project. Eric. Uh, well, thanks, thanks for the introduction, Paul. Um, I'm exhausted. Uh, <laughs> uh, I want to start off by saying that this is an example of what American Studies students and staff do. Um, the, the Heart Mountain Relocation Center is a, is a fascinating place for a number of reasons, um, and the effort to uh, make it a permanent part of Wyoming's cultural memory, um, both in terms of its structure and in terms of what it represents, is very much an American Studies project. So uh, the first slide I have to show you is the best graphic representation I could find of the 10 uh, relocation centers it also has the worst spelling. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> for, for legibility's sake, I, I allowed for heart to be misspelled. Um, and what I'm going to talk about today is um, an ongoing project in the present moment. Um, but the talk will be divided into roughly three sections. The first is just to kind of get us all up to speed on a history that's now being retrieved in many different ways, namely Japanese-American relocation during World War II. Uh, then I'll talk a little bit about how memory is, is 
held and reconstructed about places like this, very problematic places in American culture. Uh, and then finally, um, I'll um, tell you about our project where we were going around mostly in the uh, Bighorn Basin looking for existing barracks fragments. Uh, barracks are the, uh, probably the major in interpretive structure for a place like Heart Mountain or any of the relocation centers. And in the Bighorn Basin, once you know what you're looking for, they're everywhere. They're everywhere. Uh, and I'll show you uh, a few that we've concentrated on uh, and how we've tried to document them. But let's start with the basics. Um, these are the 10 relocation centers that were set up by the U.S. government uh, pursuant to uh, an executive order, 9066, uh, to relocate all people of Japanese heritage away from an exclusion zone uh, that you can see um, as, uh, I don't know what color that is, but it's not yellow, uh, along the west coast. So um, in 1942, about 120,000 people were packed up and moved off uh, with pretty much only what they could take in, in, uh, in one suitcase. Um, about 10,000 of them ended up at Heart Mountain. Um, over the course of the war, about 14,000 different individuals actually spent time in the Heart Mountain Relocation Center. So at one time, this was the third largest city in Wyoming. Um, and at, as a, a kind of civil rights, human rights issue, uh, during World War II, despite all kinds of legal challenges, everything that, I'm, that had to do with relocation was considered to be legal. And that has tremendous implications for how the memory of Heart Mountain is, is reconstructed as a very problematic episode uh, in uh, the denial of civil rights to people who were primarily about 65, 66 percent American citizens. So um, many, many thousands of American citizens were moved, moved off the West Coast uh, despite their wishes uh, in the name of a greater good, namely World War II. And, whether that's right or not has been debated uh, for a lot of years. Here's Heart Mountain under construction. Um, Heart Mountain was built in a big hurry. They could build each one of these barracks that you see uh, in less than an hour. Um, they were 120 feet long and 20 feet wide. They constructed in a big hurry, uh, lumber being in short supply. Some of the lumber was green, things shrank. Um, it was a very windy experience for people who arrived in November from Southern California, as you can imagine. Um, here's the camp in operation. Uh, at one time, uh, for those 10,000 people, there were over 400 barracks there, um, and plenty of other things too, like a high school, uh, a couple of theaters, um, et cetera, et cetera. It was a fully functioning churches. Uh, it was a fully functioning city with its own administration. Like many of the uh, relocation centers, it was placed on federal land. This was handy because you didn't have to ask permission. Uh, there was a lot of resistance, particularly, I must say, on the part of Wyoming's governor, Nils Smith, to having Japanese Americans located in the state. There was a big meeting in Salt Lake of the governors, and a lot of resistance was expressed, except for the governor of Colorado. Um, for having these people there. But since it was on federal land, this is Bureau of Reclamation land. That becomes important later on. This is Burek land that Heart Mountain is on. Uh, yeah, there were sentries, there was a gate, there were guards with guns, um, there was barbed wire, this was a compound. Now what you call that enters into a kind of lingu linguistic politics that's very interesting. Is it a concentration camp? That's what FDR called it. Is it a relocation camp? Is it a detention center? Uh, what is it? How do you describe it is a very important um, item for some people. Um, this is Bill Hosokawa, who was uh, the editor of the Heart Mountain Sentinel um, and one of the primary conduits for people uh, outside the camp to get to know what was going on in the camp. Um, and so for many years, I think, 
uh, Bill and the Japanese American Citizens League controlled how Heart Mountain was constructed as a place. Um, this becomes, well, here's Hosokawa's um, quarters in the, uh, in, inside the barrack. Um, these were made to be cozy places, but you really had to try. Um, you wouldn't necessarily get anything larger than a room 20 by 26, and that would be for however big a family you had. So these, these were tight quarters. Uh, a stove, one light hanging from the middle of the ceiling, uh, bare walls, and you had to do the rest. Um, it was hard on some people. Um, this fellow is a World War I veteran of our army who was then incarcerated during World War II and guarded by our army. Um, so perhaps I'm a visual kind of person, so perhaps looking at this, this photograph, uh, we don't get a sense of his agony, but we do get a sense of his resistance if you look around and, and see how sort of self-consciously Asian um, the decorations inside his, um, his apartment would be, and he's not smiling. Um, so, at Heart Mountain, the issue of patriotism uh, was a very, 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 very big deal. Um, if you're inside a camp uh, being guarded by the army, uh, how do you display your Americanism? Uh, what do you do uh, to show that you're not allied with the emperor of Japan, which was always the suspicion? Um, so in, in Heart Mountain, there was, a lot of, um, there was a lot of volunteering, even before people were uh, called up for the draft. Um, after the draft became a part of people's lives in Heart Mountain, then push came to shove. Are you going to serve in the same army that's guarding your parents? Um, and Heart Mountain was the home of the largest resistance to the draft among the 10 relocation centers. In fact, the biggest draft resistance trial of World War II occurred in Cheyenne and Denver um, as a result of the Fair Play Committee in Heart Mountain saying, no, we won't serve. Sixty-eight people were sentenced to various terms at uh, Leavenworth um, because of this. On the other hand, they had, they had a USO, uh, and people who came home went there. Uh, the 442nd Combat Group is the most decorated um, fighting unit in World War II. They were a part of the 5th Army, so they'd come home with their red patches and uh, uh, medals of honor, et cetera, et cetera. And those two sides, the Fair Play Committee and the Japanese American uh, Citizens League, battled over issues of loyalty down into this decade. Um, there was a meeting in Cheyenne in 2000 that was partly sponsored by the Humanities Council where for the first time they actually talked to each other. This is over 50 years after the fact. Just to show you how contested the memory of Heart Mountain is. Um, so not everything was battle. I mean, these are high school kids um, in Heart Mountain. Um, a lot of pictures were taken of Heart Mountain during the time by the War Relocation Authority or by Life Magazine. These were pictures from Life. And what they tended to do was to make it look like it wasn't an, a, an entirely unpleasant experience. Maybe it wasn't an unpleasant experience at all. I have a hard time finding pictures of Heart Mountain from the War Relocation Authority where people are not smiling. <laughs> so, so you get cute pictures like this with the doctor and the baby and of uh, the ceramic shop. Um, I wanted to show you these because these are remarkable photos. These come from, uh, this is actually 1944. Um, this is a collection at the University of Wyoming called the, Mil the Bill Manbo Collection. Um, just been published as a book by Eric Muller called The Colors of Confinement. Um, so it's nice to see color. Uh, it makes it seem less historic and more, it grabs this as more real. And it's also nice to see a whole bunch of people uh, inhabiting uh, a space. Uh, 
so we see it in operation through these color photographs, doing mundane things like going to the movies. This is a good example of a barrack, by the way. It's not a full one, but that's where their movie theater was. Um, and it's interesting to look at the pictures of children. Children become important, and I'll, I'll get into that in terms of memory in a little bit. Uh, so there we see a good row of barracks. Um, these are the first, I have two um, slides to show you of uh, drawings by Estelle Ichigo, uh, who was a, um, an Anglo married to a Japanese American who chose to be in the camp with him, even though she didn't have to be. And what she did primarily was make drawings, and they're, they're quite remarkable drawings of women and children primarily, uh, featuring the barbed wire, and sort of, sort of a view of conditions inside the camp that might undercut that kind of rosy view that you would get out of the War Relocation Administration photographs, um, emptying wastewater, for example. Um, okay, so now we're going to leave Heart Mountain as an active um, place during World War II um, and, and progress toward the present day because there are many transformations that go on. Um, and tracing those is a, is a, real, um, a, a real challenge. Uh, the first of these, and maybe in Wyoming we take this for granted, is a landscape transformation. Like this, this is Heart Mountain, um, taken from a particular perspective in 1944. Uh, the next slide is Heart Mountain in uh, 2010. All right, one's in black and white, the other one's in color. <laughs> but it's taken roughly from the same position. Uh, and you'll notice, where are the buildings? They're gone. Now, in some of the other uh, relocation centers, that would mean that, <coughs> excuse me, in 1946, a bulldozer came along and <laughs> they're gone. Uh, in the case of Heart Mountain, uh, to a lesser degree, Minidoka, the one in Idaho, and Topaz, the one in um, Utah. The buildings were used because lumber was scarce. After the war, the buildings were used in resettlement schemes, um, federally sponsored resettlement, homesteading that went on. Um, post. Uh, Amache, the one in Colorado, has run a, a big program trying to find barracks from their camp. Deployed graduate students like only a university can deploy graduate students. <laughs> and they found 28 barrack fragments. 28. All the rest of them have been burned or destroyed at some point. I could show you 28 bar barrack fragments in about a mile's worth of Lane 16 near, near Powell and we'll see some of them later on. So this is a real resource for recovering a particular kind of memory uh, at Heart Mountain. So we get this landscape transformation. There are no more barracks. There's a lot more agriculture. Uh, Heart Mountain was placed where it was because it was about to be released as another patch of land in an irrigation district that had released portions starting in 1909. So um, this is important to the history of, of Bighorn Basin, just that land came under irrigation around Powell starting in 1909 uh, and ending at the end of World War II with the release of this land to uh, settlement uh, post-war. And as with any good homesteading scheme, this goes back to the 19th century. As, as in any homesteading scheme, uh, what you did was you drew lots. There was a lottery for these parcels. Uh, and here you see in the lower, what would it be, lower right-hand corner, uh, the Heart Mountain Relocation Center has been transformed into a, uh, a land office. <laughs> um, and uh, so what you did, if you won, happy, happy camper in the upper right, if you won the lottery, you got your 160 acres, just like in the 19th century, about 160 acres. And then for one dollar, you could go down to the relocation center and buy a barrack. You were entitled to two. Nobody in his right mind took two. But one barrack, it, it, you didn't have to build it. Uh, what you had to do was saw it in half. 
<laughs> or maybe in thirds, uh, because then you had to fit it on a flatbed truck and take it to wherever it was going, so you could put it down on your, your allotment. Uh, and power tools were in short supply, and so guys would spend several days sawing those things in thirds with a handsaw. Um, you hear lots of stories about that. So they put them up on flatbed trucks, haul them off to their sites, uh, and then cobble them together. I mean, here you see two barrack fragments being put together. Remember the shape. This is a kind of L-shaped house um, that you see all over that, that basin. Uh, now, some of them have been reclad. They've got aluminum siding, they've got stucco, they, they, they're, they're masquerading as other things, but if you know what you're looking for and you see an L-shaped house of a certain size, it's a barrack. Okay? Um, and then you modified. Um, I don't know why the one, I, I kept that one in the lower right just to show it was Hard Mountain, I guess, but in the upper left, um, you see someone putting in a, um, a fireplace. Um, and so that's another way that it's hard to identify barracks is because right from the get-go they were used as sort of modular units and you, you expanded them as, as you could. So you get shots like this all the time. These, these photographs come from the irrigation district. This is, I mean, replace the, the tent with a, a, a lean-to or a sod hut and replace the, uh, the tractor with um, something involving a horse, and you've got in the 19th century history of settlement right there. This is a very iconic way of looking at um, how land is settled, at least in the Anglo system in the U.S. And then there's the history of irrigation that's really important uh, that makes the land look the way it is. Okay, so how is memory uh, controlled? Where does memory come from in terms of contemporary Heart Mountain? Um, well, one place to look for it is with the Boy Scouts. Um, there are a couple of reasons for this. Uh, in the upper left, you see the Boy Scouts saluting or preparing to salute. Um, and the Boy Scouts uh, displayed patriotism and were seen as patriotic in the camp during the 1940s. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the demographics of, of Heart Mountain memory, um, but in the lower right, you can see what the result is. At this point, we have relatively aged people who are veterans of Heart Mountain. Um, and just by the nature of the way life works, uh, the older they get, the younger the memory becomes. So they experienced Heart Mountain as teenagers or as pre-teenagers. And so in that experience, the Boy Scouts uh, become even more important. And here you see the flag raising at the dedication of the Heart Mountain uh, interpretive center um, a couple of years ago uh, where raising the flag with Boy Scouts from the, the present day troop uh, and the uh, remnants of one of the five Boy Scout troops during World War II uh, was a kind of centerpiece. And now I'm going to try to um, play an audio clip. This is an adventure in technology that may or may not work. I'm not a Mac kind of guy. so. I'll try to maneuver my way through this, but I want to play it for you because, um, as you'll see in the next slide, the Boy Scouts are an important reason why um, Heart Mountain is the way it is. Uh, but before I get there, I want to play an audio clip for you from Pete Simpson's recollections of Heart Mountain. So this is Pete talking about his first trip out to Heart Mountain. Oh, we're all going to go out there and we're going to spend an entire day at the relocation center with Boy Scout Troop 379. By the way, there were five Boy Scout troops out there. This was just one. We were going to go out and have a jamboree with troops 379 at the Japanese relocation center. We arrived at the... I'm going to add a little something here. I'll tell you what the old Glenn said. He said, boys, we're going out there to this camp. Those boys, they give the same salute we give. They place the same allegiance, and they wear the same uniform, and we're going out. You better talk to your parents about it. Two parents wouldn't let the boys go. The rest of them did. It seemed to take forever to reach the relocation center, and it probably did in the old days with the rumors the way they were. The first speaker was the scoutmaster from Troop 379. And again, to the astonishment of many of the young men who had not 
had the advantage of going to the camp with, his, with their minister, the guy spoke perfect American English. That was a big revelation for some of Troop 350's most stalwart members. Next, Glenn Livingston gave a talk. Both scoutmasters made an impression on us because they both spoke about the preparation of young men for life and about the war in a very patriotic way. Following the initial talks by the scout leaders, we worked on merit badges. I remember very, a very skillful young Japanese boy who must have been practicing tying ropes and knots out in California. It was more than a little bit embarrassing that a guy from the cowboy state could not do the first damn knot. And, and this guy was spinning them out like he would do it, like he could do, it, do them in his sleep. We exchanged projects, did merit badges, and had quite a morning. I did notice that we stayed pretty close to our Caucasian Kobe friends, and the Japanese stayed pretty close to their friends. We seemed to be making formal exchanges rather than informal exchanges. I'm not really sure whether it was planned or how that worked out, but it did help us to ease into the events of the day. By noon time, we were sitting pretty, you know, we were sitting pretty much mixed together in the recreation hall over a hot meal. In the afternoon, we broke up into less formal groups, and I was paired with a young Japanese American who liked art, and so did I. He drew a picture of Tarzan that was terrific. We then went outside and tossed the football around. It could have been out there on Blystein Avenue in Cody. It was cold as hell, sorry. <laughs> and there was uh, snow on the ground. It looked just as godforsaken as the, at the camp as it did in Cody. My Japanese friend had a dandy sense of humor. He said in one of those ball-throwing uh, incidents, I'm so cold, even my goose pimples got goose pimples. I laughed like he was Bob Hope. I thought that was the funniest damn thing I ever heard. I followed him around the rest of the day, waiting for his next one line. <laughs> um, after tossing the football around, my friend took me to one of the tar paper shacks and we went inside. His mother was making tea, but she also had hot chocolate and cookies. I remember how gracious she was and how good the hot chocolate tasted after our toss of the football. After the hot chocolate, my friend took me a few yards down the front of the tar paper barrel. Then we went into another room where his grandmother lived. My friend's grandmother was a very dignified little lady. Though the outside of the barrack was poor and bedraggled looking, the inside was a scene of oriental <coughs> opulence with tapestry hanging on the wall and a little shrine in front of the room. It was almost like a religious experience. Though she could not speak English, my friend told me that his grandmother said she was glad I was there and that she hoped I was enjoying the day. Well, there you get a sense of that reconstructed memory of being a young man playing out at Heart Mountain. And you also get a sense of how the barrack stayed in, in Pete's memory um, through all the years. Um, as it turns out, uh, that Boy Scout memory is pivotal uh, because of the two guys in the upper left-hand corner uh, whom I call the Norm and Al show. Uh, this is Norm Mineta. Uh, and Al Simpson, who met because of one of these Boy Scout jamborees. Um, and they tell the story about how they went out and, and played practical jokes on people. And Al playing a practical joke, can you imagine? <laughs> uh, and, and of course, since one of them became a US Senator and the other became the mayor of San Jose and a representative and a cabinet member, uh, they're both prominent people, and they're very generous of their time, as you can see in the lower right with, uh, with Dave Reitz, who became a kind of impresario of, uh, of uh, the Alan Norm Show. Um, the Alan Norm Show was incredibly important because what it, what it did was it taught recognition that something had happened out there. And if you think back, those of you who have been in Wyoming for a long time, think of, of your own memories of Heart Mountain. Um, it didn't really come into public memory much until maybe, what, 10, 15 years ago? So just kind of recognition is a big deal. Uh, and then reconciliation. 
the fact that Norm and Al are now fast friends and kind of joke about each other and do the things that friends do, that's an incredibly important display of what the Heart Mountain site is now trying to become. A place where uh, the communities of Cody and Powell in a very touchy relationship with the relocation center, as you could tell by what Pete was saying with the scoutmaster saying, boys, you better go home and tell your parents. Um, very complicated history during World War II with a very complicated multi-generational history of Japanese inhabiting and post-World War II remembering of the site. Bringing those parties together is hard work. Uh, when I went to the opening of the, of the Interpretive Center a couple of years ago, the whole community was in this big tent, 500 people, and they're working hard at, at doing what communities do, which is to get together and sort of negotiate a common ground. It was a very powerful experience, not for the speeches, although they were good, but just watching people around a table talk about varieties of experience and how you legitimate oops, points of view um, into constructing a place. It, it was really amazing. Um, in all of this, the barrack is an important, the important, the iconic, I think, symbol of uh, the relocation experience. Uh, top picture, this is a barrack going back home in Manzanar. Uh, bottom two pictures, this is a barrack being taken from Hart Mountain and placed in Los Angeles, where now it is the central interpretive feature of the Japanese American National Museum. You go up to the second floor, they talk a lot about relocation, and the centerpiece is this gutted barrack from Hart Mountain uh, that has exhibits in it and outside it. So the barrack, I think, is really iconic. Um, and so iconic that the Heart Mountain, Real Heart Mountain Interpretation Center uh, is shaped like two barracks. Uh, there had been previous designs. In fact, one, the first design they passed to the Japanese American community in Los Angeles. And they looked at it and they said, looks like a pagoda. We're not Japanese. We're Japanese Americans. Um, and so over the course of about five years, they negotiated what this thing would look like and what would be inside. Those of you who remember, say, the Holocaust Museum being put into Washington, DC, or the National Museum of the American Indian, design is important. That's what you fight over. Okay, so this is the product of uh, a lot of negotiation and in the background you see uh, the, the last, the most famous of the remaining structures, namely uh, the chimney that was associated with the hospital laundry. Um, but as I said, increasingly the memory of Heart Mountain is being presided over by people who experienced Heart Mountain um, as cute little kids. <laughs> uh, look at them, what's not to like? Um, and furthermore, in their experience, what's not to like? The problem with, uh, with people of this generation is that if you were under 14, likely as not, your experience at Heart Mountain was not terrible. Some of them will even tell you uh, that they had a good time. How could this be? Well. Uh, parents were very concerned about the loosening of family bonds. Kids were less concerned because they could run around as feral packs of youths, <laughs> throwing dirt clods at each other, going to multiple uh, mess halls for dinner, doing unspeakable jokes, uh, playing unspeakable jokes in the latrines. We don't even want to go there. Uh, <laughs> you know, and just, just doing the things that kids do when parents aren't around. And, and so for them, it, it might have been two or three years of real adventure. Uh, but now, as 60-year-olds and 70-year-olds, they are presiding over a spot that for their parents was at best problematic and most likely was the kind of thing that they didn't talk about until quite recently. So they are commemorating, they're honoring their families. They are generally Nisei, the parents are Nisei, which are American born, uh, first people allowed to be citizens, they're American born. 
These people are Sansei, or the next generation, or Yansei, the one after that. Tremendously accomplished, but their experience at Heart Mountain at best um, is not bad. Uh, so now, having you know, sort of surveyed the, the territory in the 40s um, and, and given you a, a kind of hint at the problematic nature of um, dealing with this memory, I uh, get to our project. Uh, what we've done over the last several years is to um, try to find barracks and barrack owners, particularly owners who date back to the, um, the homestead period. Uh, here's Jane Robertson. Her father was uh, draw number two. He had the second pick in the second draw. There were three, three lotteries. So he got a prime spot. Uh, and we're documenting her barrack, and I'll show you that in a second. And we're talking to her about her uh, upbringing uh, in, 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 the, in the basin. Okay, so here's a barrack in 1947-48, uh, newly cobbled together in that L shape that I was motioning to uh, a while back. And here's Jane Robertson's house. Uh, modified. Uh, there's a kind of inset uh, front entrance. Um, there's a piece that's been added off the right side, but you can tell this is a barrack. It's stuccoed on the outside and cemented on the inside, so it's not going to fall over anytime soon, but it's a barrack. This is Jane Robertson's land, um, which came under irrigation after World War II. Before that, it would have been sagebrush. Um, here are some ways that you can identify barracks uh, if you're looking around. These become important um, as, as you try to find buildings that, uh, that are recognizable. Uh, there's a way that the electricity comes in that results in this kind of scoop light over the end. There's a five panel door. Um, there's a three over three window. There are funky things that happen with the eaves. I mean, there are a number of ways that you can identify these barracks. Um, and once you start to see them, they're everywhere. Um, here's one that's being used as uh, a good Wyoming all-purpose room. You, <laughs> you, you, go, you go in there and you get an anthology of beer cans uh, that have yet to, be, yet to be taken down to the recycler. Uh, there's a government issue, 1942 stove in there. They still have the original stove. Uh, and she's apologizing, oh, I gotta clean this place up. And, no, you don't. I mean, you're, <laughs> this is not gonna happen. Uh, <laughs> and, and so, uh, on the inside, I mean, if there was any doubt that this is a barrack, there's the window. You know, and there's, there's, there's a way in which it's been blocked in so it doesn't slide, but in its original configuration, you could slide it open horizontally. Uh, not that you would ever want to in Wyoming, although it does get hot in the summertime in Nepal. Um, and this is the same barrack down here in the lower right. Um, there's an interesting way in which these barracks are so easy to assimilate into Wyoming um, homesteads because they so closely resemble single wide trailers, which is kind of like the basic building block of rural Wyoming buildings. And so you can look at her house which is in the upper part, and look at the barrack, which is in the lower part, and the similarities are, are striking. Uh, that house started off as a single wide trailer, got that little mud room on the front. There's another addition over on the left-hand side. I mean, this is, this is Wyoming for you. So the barrack fits right in, just in the way that people inhabit their land. Um, everything you see here, uh, well, both of the things you see here, down below the horizon line. Those are all barrack fragments. Okay, so these, these are still the basic uh, building blocks of a lot of places in, in Wyoming. Um, so here's our problem. Um, this is a typical war relocation authority picture. Um, and it's about the most unsmiley picture I could find, and it's not totally smiley only because the guy has his back turned. Um, people who took these photographs were taking them to reassure the rest of us that things were okay, 
inside the camps. Okay. So just in terms of visual memory, uh, it's a pretty smiley experience um, as far as we can see. Um, and the history that comes after the war is so compelling. That history of settlement dates back to the 19th century. And it's all about pioneering and progress and putting down stakes and uh, the classic American tale. Um, and so we have two, two narratives inhabiting the same space, namely the barrack. Uh, and how to balance them is, is, a real, uh, is a real challenge, but I think it's worth the effort uh, because there's enough of the language of pioneering and um, they're agriculturalists, both sets of inhabitants. Um, they both cared for the land. They both built lots of things. I mean, there's a lot to talk about between these two populations. I just want to show you this is the inside of the barracks, lower right, with very skinny people wearing relatively form-fitting clothing, as would have happened. <laughs> um, and then on the upper uh, left is the inside of a barrack. Um, from about two or three years ago. So thoroughly inhabited. Now it's, it's, it's been in the same family for, for a long, long time. So here again, there's, this is a picture of activity in a wood shop. I could have picked a metal shop or there are any number of shops um, because they were self-sufficient as a community during World War II. Um, here's a picture of a barrack that for a long time had been used as a kind of a garage slash wood storage area. Uh, here's a picture of a barrack on Arlie George's dairy farm. That's a, um, a place where he stores uh, equipment. Um, the inside of it is, is much more pristine than the outside, which has been clad so that you wouldn't recognize it as a barrack unless you knew what you were looking at. Um, here is a portion of a barrack um, out on uh, the Frank place. Here's another one just out in the middle of nowhere that's about to be torn down. This is the inside. The upper left shows you a kind of vestibule that you would enter to uh, go to two different apartments. They were of varying sizes. There were generally three apartments in each barrack. And here, I hadn't noticed this, but here is the remnant of a chimney that would have served, it would have been a two-sided, um, the flue would have served two different stoves in two different apartments. So that's, that's uh, been maintained up to the present day. I hesitate to go back, I think it's been torn down. And if you look carefully in some of these barracks, you can see where but they've been sawed in half. Uh, this one had been put back together again, but um, this was the product of a considerable amount of muscle and God knows how many saw blades um, in 1947-48. Um, some of them get incorporated into durable structures, like this is the Elks Lodge in downtown Powell. Um, and the, uh, the first thing you drive down the road, screech, L-shape, aha. <laughs> you know, and so uh, you do a little research and you find that the dimensions are right and, and there are stories to, to support this. Collecting stories is important. Um, this portion of the Oaks Lodge is a barrack. Um, okay. Or you can just drive down the road. If that isn't a barrack, I don't know what the heck is. Um, that is just a classic um, barrack shape. Uh, and here is a barrack that I covet. Um, and I know the Heart Mountain Interpretive Center covets, covets it too. This is in, uh, um, on the way from, um, just, out of Powell, uh, just out of Cody, on the way to, the, um, um, to, to Montana, um, via the road that will lead you to Sunlight Basin. I think. It's, it's complete, it's intact, it's privately owned, we can't get to it. Um, but, what really attracts me to these barracks is that um, there's such an interesting and problematic history inside that pertains to two different communities. And if I have time, and I think I, think I do, uh, I only have one slide left, and this is going to last four minutes. I want to return to Pete, 
who, between the two brothers, just between you and me, is the more reflective of the two, um, especially, especially in this piece. Um, okay, well, I had at least six experience at experiences at the relocation center. The last one, and perhaps the most telling, did not have anything to do with conversations or with an interconnection inter with anybody at the relocation center. It was a trip that mom and dad had to take to Hart Mountain for a year. I remember that when we came to the gate on the way home, dad stopped the car and got out to talk to somebody. As we sat waiting in the car, I looked over my right shoulder and I saw a soldier and his girlfriend standing under a guard tower. He had one arm around her he had a red Fifth Army patch on his shoulder. I will always remember that picture. I can see it now, just in memory. And not just in memory, but in technical. The red patch, that fellow with a sort of a jaunty look, looking at a kid in a car, a proud look, smiling. And I involuntarily waved. He did not wave back. He just smiled, and we drove away. That might have been, been the beginning of the first independent, intellectual, challenging, political, and philosophical thought that I had about this whole thing. That thought stemmed from six experiences, a friend in the camp, a Boy Scout meeting, a church muff, and an occasion of discontentment and unsettling feelings. It, dislodged my comfortable stereotyping, and it left me for the first time without a ready-made answer to questions of national right and wrong. I grew up in those years, and my growing up became conscious that day. I have only one regret out of all of it. I wish I would have kept my Boy Scout friend's name, so I might have kept in touch with him. My brother, however, did find one of his Boy Scout Jamboree friends, Norm Manetta. He and Al shared the experience in Congress of the United States, where Norm, the former mayor of San Jose, served at the time of this writing as a congressman from California. He later became Secretary of Transportation Cabinet, cabinet member under Clinton. They have a best, they have a fast friendship to this day. I found myself at UCLA recently looking at relocation pictures in an exhibit. <coughs> I was looking mostly at the faces of people in the photos to see how visibly the tragedy might have been written on their faces. Though I never saw it in their faces, I could see tragedy in every grain of the pictures. The distance between Cody and Hart Mountain was 12 and one half miles but it seemed like the longest trip in the world for a young boy between two cultures and two separate times. Thank you. I, I actually had, I made a talk to a banker uh, with a heart added something to it. It was my first contact Thanks. with ambiguity. That's a fancy word. But boy, is that ever the feeling you have ambiguous nature to the way in which the world is and the way in which your position on that world on that planet is. Anyhow, that, I haven't read that for a long time. That's, that's, <laughs> men of Troop 250. Oops. Always snap to attention when Oops. you said that. So, moral ambiguity. That's a really good way of putting it. Um, moral ambiguity. Um, and... For people who live in the, uh, in the valley, in the basin, um, that experience is formative too um, at, at any level. Um, this is um, IJ and Lola Frank. Um, they're the people who owned the, uh, one of the sheds that I showed you that was a barrack. Um, and um, this is their, the way that they present themselves to people who come to their home in the way of an address. And you can see Homestead 71. 
So, you know, this is like 60 years in the past, and yet people still identify themselves with that, vis-a-vis -vis that homesteading experience. So, for us, it's easy to sort of tease out the barracks, find out where they are. Well, it's not easy, but they're everywhere. We find them. The, the, the challenge for us, and challenge for me, uh, anyway, is to um, allow them to be re-inhabited by both stories. Uh, I know the Japanese American community is eager to see this happen, because if you ask them, they can come up with an address just like that. I was in block two, barrack number such and such, section so and so. So they're very particular about the same structure, and that's why I think it's so interesting. Um, so if you drive through the Bighorn Basin and you see something that looks like a barrack, drop me a line. Because we're, <laughs> <laughs> we're going to find hundreds of them, and it shows that the Heart Mountain landscape is still in the Bighorn Basin. In my mind's eye, I want a big map at the Interpretive Center, and you flip on a switch, and it shows all the barrack fragments. That's how the two stories interact in space. <laughs> Thanks. I had never heard about these Japanese, whether I call it an interpretive camp or what, um, I had never heard of these from any of my high school readings or teachers until I became an adult. And I don't know whether that's just a phenomenon of having grown up in the Midwest where there were hardly any Japanese Americans at all. You, I, I've asked my students every semester, just as a matter of curiosity, I teach a general education class in Introduction to American Studies, how many, have heard, how many of you have heard about the Hard Mountain Relocation Center and what went on with Japanese Americans? About half the hands go up. And I know for a fact that they've been presented this at least twice in American history classes, but it's like, in one ear and out the other, and that's, that's sort of a problem. Uh, over on the other side. I wanted to ask you if you've read the book Hotel at the Corner of Fair and Sweet. I haven't, but I, I know that I should. It's a very interesting read. Uh -huh. um, and I think it, it gives a, a pretty accurate, in my mind anyway, picture of the discrimination that went on against Japanese Americans and how they lost everything. You know, sold things for pennies on a dollar and never. I'll tell you frankly, it, 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 and this occurs in culture in many ways, how to deal with what the, what the Germans would have called, because they were being re-educated by us during the late 40s and 50s, the burden of guilt. How did nations handle stuff that's gone wrong? What do you do? Reparations? There were reparations in the 80s, but that didn't do it. Um, so how do, you, how do you do a make good on this? Um, I think that's part of why is so important. Well, I might be really booed out of this whole audience, but um, I, I have read a lot of books, including The Hotel Bitter in Sweden, um, a lot of unbroken stories about World War II, and I would say to you that it's easy for us to sit here and to judge the government and to judge what happened then, and to say this is such an amoral thing, but I think when you declare war, and when you begin a war, you begin a series of amoral activities that I don't know, we're not in the context of the fear and the torture and things that went on at that time. And so, I'm not saying this is the right thing to do, but when you're at war, and um, some of these people were Japanese, um, hadn't been here very long, who knows where their allegiances lie. So I'm just saying, there's another side to this, is we're not seeing because everything is safe and nice and we're not at war with these people, and that's it. It's, well, no, that, that's, thank you for that comment, because that's, um, that's really important to remember, um, that it was not, I don't want to put it as a double negative, it was ambiguous what was to be done. Um, so that, for example, if you take the legal, the place where ambiguity is, is sussed out, where it's, where it's negotiated, is in the court system. Um, and there were court cases, uh, very famous ones during World War II, uh, Fred Korematsu, a uh, guy named Hirabayashi, and uh, uh, several others, the ex parte Endo, which really ended everything, um, that went to the Supreme Court. And until Endo, which came in 1944, everything was declared legal. Everything that was done uh, 
uh, the curfews, the relocation, the confinement, pass through our legal system um, successfully. So it's not like um, there was, um, there were plenty of voices, the American Friends Service Committee, the Quakers, there were a lot of churches that were involved on the side of, of the people who were being interned, but it was a contested act that was declared to be legal. Um, now we could go into the kind of special nature of the war against Japan, which was a racialized war in my opinion, but you know, it would not have been unambiguous, even on the part of the Japanese Americans, who would have felt unsafe you know, on the West Coast because of what people in the neighborhood uh, would have thought of them. By the way, I must say, Endo succeeded because it turned out there had been an investigation during the beginning of the war, uh, and they could not find disloyal Japanese people, but that's another matter. Just tying that last comment together with the question earlier about hearing about it, mm -hmm. history classes. Uh, I, I grew up in Powell, not far from sure. this center, and uh, been, my entire childhood, all there was was the chimney. Mm -hmm. And my father fought in World War II in the Pacific, and I'm sure some of my teachers did as well. No one ever mentioned it. We never stopped there as a child. Nor would my father ever wanted to. And, and so I think it's not a coincidence that this work is being done now, that the like, interpretive center was built as that generation ended to these racial members. Can I get one more? One more. Yeah. One more. One more question. Hi. My parents were in the Uh huh. Can, can I say two things very quickly? Because Paul's minding the time and I have to ride home on the plane with him and I don't want to blame each other. Number one, uh, one of the things that we might talk about after the end of all this is who belongs and how do you tell? What's the nature of citizenship and how much does it mean? Uh, the other thing is that um, I tell my students, think of the opposite. We think about incarceration here, but we might also think about mobility here. Because what this did, and the barracks are mobile, and you've seen that, but at, at the end of the war, even during the war, people were leaving those camps uh, to go to places in the interior. And if you were to trace Japanese American inhabitation of the United States, this is a really significant moment in a kind of Japanese diaspora, where Japanese communities, Japanese American communities, moved to Chicago, uh, Milwaukee, St. Louis, uh, New York City, places that had not had Japanese inhabitation prior to World War II. So um, this is how uh, pioneering headed east, if you want to put it that way. Thanks. Thank you very much.